Did you know that according to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, two-thirds of all our fruits and veggies eaten in the United States come from outside the country? And there are all kinds of problems with that. For one, an apple that had to travel hundreds or even thousands of miles to get to your plate can't be all that fresh or nutritious. And I say that's just crazy, especially when we can grow so many different varieties in our own front and backyards. Jumping into growing your own food is actually quite simple. You just need to know the rules. My free webinar, Introduction to Urban Farming, begins to frame out your pathway to growing your own healthy food. In this free webinar, you'll learn the three simple steps to becoming an urban farmer, the five components of healthy soil, and how to think regeneratively, which is, by the way, one of the most important concepts we need to be exploring right now. Will you join me in this webinar and help co-create the food revolution? Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to urbanfarmu.org to sign up for your free webinar. That's GARDEN to 44222 or urbanfarmu.org. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the Grow Your Own Food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Michael Judd, author of Edible Landscaping with a Permaculture Twist, to talk about his experience with edible landscape design. Michael has worked with agro, ecological, and whole system design throughout the Americas for the last 20 years, focusing on applying permaculture and ecological design to increase local food security and community health in both tropical and temperate growing regions. He is the founder of both Ecologia LLC, Edible and Ecological Landscape Design, and Project Bonafide, an international nonprofit supporting agroecology research. Michael has returned to the Mid-Atlantic to put down his roots and apply his knowledge of whole system design to suburbia. In addition to authoring Edible Landscape with a Permaculture Twist, Teaching, and Building Straw Bale Houses, Michael and his wife, Ashley, recently welcomed Wyatt Wizard to their world. Their budding homestead is in Frederick, Maryland. Welcome to the show today, Michael. Thanks, Greg. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get to where you're at now? Well, I'm originally from Appalachia. We're here in Maryland. And I had the good fortune around the age of 20 to begin living in rural Latin America. And along that journey, got to live with some of the last of the Lacandon Mayans, uh, Mm. live in yeah, La Selva wow. Lacandona. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's a last stretch of jungle between southern Mexico and Guatemala, uh, where the last of the Mayans retreated during the conquistadores, mm-hmm. Christian Christianity time in that part of the world. So they retreated deep into the jungle where they couldn't uh, be got at. And I was fortunate enough to go in there maybe about 18 years ago and live with them and help design a compost toilet uh, that was m- part of my my intention of going in there. Uh-huh. And during that time of living in the community, I got to experience the way they've been living with the land, generation after generation, oh, keeping yeah. it regre- regenerative uh-huh. um, for all of their needs, for their building needs, for their medicinal needs, for their all their food, uh, fibers for their animals, arts for their crafts. Uh, so they were managing the jungle around them to meet all of their needs. And that really dramatically changed my life uh, in understanding how we can actually live as a species uh, in a regenerative way. Mm -hmm. So I got to realize this is actually possible, not something I was reading about or philosophizing about, but seeing us as humans being able to do this. Um, Then I got very sick and pretty much had to be carried out of the jungle, which also began another journey uh, of healing and working with uh, plants Uh and growing things. And I came back to the States and almost stumbled into Earth Haven, which is oh, yeah. the yeah the first permaculturally designed community in North America, mm-hmm. down in North Carolina, yep. outside of Asheville, uh, 
wonderful place, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I, I stepped into it at its genesis. So without wow. really knowing what permaculture was, I was actually drawn there by the, by they were doing natural building. They were building like a 13-sided, Mayan-designed 13-sided uh, community center. Wow. So that's what drew me in without knowing what permaculture was, but just coming from living with the Mayans, all of a sudden I was in this world that was pretty much a translation of what I was living in sort of a, um, I don't know what you call it, more of a current North American, European uh, culture. Mm-hmm. So it had all this translation of indigenous knowledge applied to modern realities. Oh, wow. Uh, so anyway, so I, I spent pretty much the last couple of decades going between Latin America and North America doing permaculture and then living with rural communities uh, on and off and just mixing that into my learning and my designing. Wow. That's a story. (laughs) That's filling in a few of the gaps. Yeah. You mentioned a word that I want to kind of uh, tease apart a little bit. You said regenerative. So for those of our listeners that don't have a sense of what that is, can you presence that? In my experience... Uh, certainly living with the Mayans, regenerative meaning that the land is able to continue to be productive and and not be depleted. So a natural healthy ecosystem, let's say a healthy forest system, is constantly regenerating itself. It's creating surplus as well as always meeting its own needs uh-huh. uh, as compared to many of our modern day farming systems which keep depleting the soil, keep taking away from it, keep having to put inputs into it. That's not regenerative. Um, so regenerative systems are ones that kind of keep feeding themselves, keep re themselves mm-hmm. and also creating a surplus at the same time. Nice. So along those lines, permaculture, let's talk about that. Can you kind of define what that is for our listeners? In, in many ways, it is a regenerative practice. Uh-huh. It's, it's observation of natural, healthy ecosystems, observing how those systems work and interact, taking that knowledge and then using it to design uh, our landscapes for the human needs as well as supporting the other aspects of life around us. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, that's kind of a big nutshell there. Yeah. But it, it's, it's taking simple observations and then uh, creating things on our landscape that serve us. Perfect. And also in your bio, we, we mentioned agroecology. Can you kind of presence what that is? That's also a, a large term. Uh, <laughs> yeah. in, my exper- in my experience uh, of agroecology, I've worked with it in larger systems in Latin America. I, um, I started a, a nonprofit in Nicaragua 15 years ago, Project Bonafide. And it, its focus was very agroecology as well. It was sort of taking the concepts of permaculture and going a little more broad with it, mm-hmm. uh, working with existing agricultural models and improving them uh, in the sense of, you know, bringing in more perennials with the annual systems, um, you know, utilizing windbreaks, multi-purpose windbreaks. Some, sometimes it's also called alley cropping oh, where, yeah. You, yeah, where you'll grow – sort of rows of a perennial, usually something that you can coppice, meaning you sort of chop it uh, and drop it. You, sometimes those are nitrogen-fixing species. Oh, right. uh-huh. So, And then in between those, those rows of perennials, you would grow your beans or your cabbage, your annual crops, which are still what you're relying on for market and economy. Right. So it's, it's sort of stacking functions like we talk about in permaculture, but, you know, maintaining you know that that sort of agricultural model and market at the same time it's really kind of that blending and mixing of agriculture and ecology and it's just you know it can morph in different ways but really trying to diversify a mainstream agriculture Mm -hmm. so you you mentioned another permaculture term which i actually absolutely love and that's stacking functions can you kind of define that for us (laughs) stacking functions is kind of getting the most most bang for your buck, uh-huh. if you want to use an American term here. Yeah, let's do it. it. Yeah, trying to be smart about having something do as many things as possible in, in, a, in a limited space mm-hmm. or within a space so that things can, in a natural ecosystem, would feed upon each other. Um, in, in a stacked function, we would, we would put a design in that would have multiple services at one time. What might that look um, like? Uh, for a simple example, yeah. uh, uh, an herb spiral. 
is kind of a cliche permaculture design, mm-hmm. uh, but it has many functions. Uh, for me and my and my landscapes, the herb spiral is a wonderful growing space. Uh-huh. It, it it creates microclimates. It extends your growing season, mm-hmm. but then it also is a great habitat for oh, yeah. um, beneficials mm-hmm. um, for things that are going to help balance the insect ecology in my landscape. All those nooks and crannies around my stones that are there year round are also helping me balance. So instead of just being a place to grow my food, I'm also, you know, creating a habitat that's going to help balance the overall ecology. That's a very simple, so I'm stacking a couple yeah. of functions. Right. And the more the more functions you can stack uh, into a design, um, the more service it does for you. Mm-hmm. So wh- give us a picture, obviously a, a word picture, of what a, a, a herb spiral or garden spiral is. So an herb spiral... It, or a garden spiral, yes, you can plant what you would like in them, is sort of a snail shell design. Mm-hmm. Um, I like my spirals to raise up to about three feet in height. Mm. Uh, an average you know, size for a, you know, a suburban landscape might be six feet in diameter mm-hmm. by three feet high. Very easy to build. You do not need to have uh, skills as a mason. I proved that, I think, the first time I built one. <laughs> Yeah, and, and it's very fun, and and you just build as you go around. You just get higher and higher. You create a higher stack until you come up to the top of the spiral, and mm-hmm. then in between that stone, which is naturally formed, a bed, and you can fill that then with your compost right. and your soil, and you can plant that with strawberries, with herbs, um, really a cornucopia mm-hmm. of things, and it, and it maximizes a small space. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times... I'll have clients who live in suburbia or an urban yard, very small, and it only has one patch of sun. And they're like, mm-hmm. I want a garden. I want to grow tomatoes. I mm-hmm. want herbs. And, and I'm looking at their yard, and they only have that one little patch. And I'm thinking, okay, let's maximize this. Let's spiral it so that we get more footprint, you know, for the space that it's in. Yeah. And, and you can make them large. I mean, I've, ma- I've made them easily 12 foot. In, in width, I mean, really, you, if you had the stone and the earth, you yeah. could make them very large and make mm-hmm. a walking path in it. And, and I think also, uh, which I think is very important as well, especially in bridging these designs mm-hmm. into mainstream culture, is aesthetics. I think they oh, yeah. add a beautiful architectural element to the landscape, uh, what I call sort of edible architecture, that is there year-round, especially in our part of the world where it gets cold in the winter and everything looks kind of bleak, mm-hmm. you know, seeing those designs on the landscape, seeing really nice trellising, seeing, you know, nice stacked stone spirals is, is heartening during the cold. It, it reminds us and, it, and it's something that just holds presence on the landscape. So I always try to, you know, put the aesthetics into design, permaculture, edible landscaping so that more people are drawn toward it. You know, things you can do with an HOA, Mm -hmm. a homeowners association, you know, things that would look really good. I mean, I do designs for really high-end restaurants, which are very picky, but it can be done and it can look really good and it can be productive. That's stacking another function. Wow, cool. So one of the products that we use to build herb spirals here in Phoenix is what we call urbanite or broken up concrete. It's a free, Mm. you know, it's a free thing, you know, when people break up a sidewalk, you save it. Have you ever done one of those? I have not. I uh, I would like to. I've seen some beautiful designs. Yeah. Uh, I've seen some nice terracing done mm-hmm. with urbanite as oh, well, yeah. and, and it's a wonderful resource. Uh, it has the same benefits of, of, of drawing and holding that, that, that heat for season extending, yeah. and as long as there's enough moisture, the plants love it. They thrive. Things yeah. in the spirals just go bonsai. So, yeah, I think urbanite's a, a great resource yeah. to use. Perfect. So how can your raised bed gardens harvest water every time it rains? <laughs> so and this is, this is a, a design I use um, very often. Uh, it's one of the first, when I look at a landscape, the mm-hmm. first things I look at are water, yep. water flow onto the landscape, water mm-hmm. coming off the houses, all the surfaces. It's one of the things I do is I just read the landscape for water. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, how do we, if, if it's a good situation, how do we capture that and hold that? Mm-hmm. And one of the simplest designs, as long as you're not on too steep of a slope, is to create swales, raised beds on contour. Mm-hmm. So by that I mean they're perpendicular to the slope, mm-hmm. and basically you you're digging out a a basin, 
and you're putting that soil on the downhill side to create a berm. So you have a basin and a berm. Mm -hmm. I usually fill my basin in with wood chips. Oh yeah. And and then and then on that berm, you know, I'll amend it with some compost, and then I'll go ahead and that's a nice raised bed for planting whatever you would like: your rose collection, your mm -hmm. berry bushes, your gardens, your herbs. Things are going to flourish there because as the water comes down the landscape, when it rains, it falls into that basin. And since uh -huh. it's on contour, it's not pushing the water in any direction. It stops, it fills, and then it sinks, it sinks in. in. And then in that, that recharges the water table, not just for that berm, mm -hmm. but for 20, 30, 40 feet down slope, it is holding the water in the landscape and regenerating that landscape, whether it's your yard, your neighbor's yard. So, you know, this is going to benefit lawn, mm -hmm. anything. It's not just an edible landscape design. It's, and it's also a wonderful way to help filter water that's running off oh, maybe yeah. from your roof, from your driveway. Those mm -hmm. wood chips will, will attract ambient fungi and bacteria, and as that runoff, if it does have some chemicals in it, will be digested largely by the wood chips and the fungi in there. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you're stacking a function again. You're helping steward the runoff from your landscape, maybe your neighbor's landscape. Mm -hmm. You're harvesting that water uh, into, your, into your landscape. So you're cleansing it, using it, harvesting it, being productive with it. I, I love swales, and, and they're really kind of sinuous and, and sexy, because they usually are snaking across a landscape. Right. They're following the natural movement uh -huh. of the landscape. And when you look at one, it really just kind of just fits because it is following the movement of the land. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. So you mentioned mushrooms. Uh, how can we mm -hmm. incorporate growing mushrooms in our landscape? Oh. And how do we make sure? Here's a, here's a better part of that question. How do, make, how do we make sure that they're edible? Or are you proposing edible mushrooms? I am proposing edible mushrooms. I always do. And and growing your own mushrooms, you know, really takes out the guesswork of what you're eating. Mm. Um, it, it's mm -hmm. very different. You know, growing your own mushrooms is different than foraging your own mushrooms. Right. And one of my favorite mushrooms, which grows very well, is known by many names. One of them is Garden Giant. Uh, another is Wine Cap. Mm. And uh, the Latin for it is Strophoria. And it is a terrestrial fungi that grows in organic matter, generally wood chips. It loves wood chips. Oh, so, nice. uh -huh. so, yeah, so another stack function is if your swale is harvesting water and it's got enough trapped water, enough trapped moisture in those wood chips, you can inoculate those wood chips with the strophoria spawn. Mm -hmm. So spawn is just a... a, a usually sawdust. It's a woody medium right. that the mycelium, which is the body of what fungi is, mm -hmm. that creates the fruit, which is the mushroom we actually eat, but the actual body is fungi, will run through those wood chips very quickly. It's a, it's a very opportunistic uh, fungi. And when it's happy, and sometimes that's within seven or eight months of inoculating the wood chips, it'll just literally produce hundreds of wine caps. And as long as there's plenty of organic matter on your landscape, it'll begin just to spread, and you will find for years and years, maybe forever to come, uh, wine caps all over your landscape. Wow. So very delicious. Yeah, it's it's a meaty, nutty, uh, very beautiful mushroom. And its stacking function, apart from actually eating it, it is bringing in more nutrients yep. to all of your plants in your landscape. Right. So it's doing this awesome ecological service as well as creating something tasty for you. Wow, where does one get the seed, or you call it spawn? Where does one the get spawn. that? spawn. Yeah, uh, there's many places. A couple of my favorite uh, resources for, for all things growing, growing mushrooms uh, is Field and Forest Products. Mm -hmm. I believe they're in Wisconsin. Wonderful people. Uh, I've worked with them and, and used their, their spawn for many years. Uh, and then, you know, the, the guru of all things fungi is Paul Stamets. Oh, of course. And his company is Fungi Perfecti. I believe it's fungiperfecti.com. And again, they're both wonderful resources. And, and you can also do log culture. So you can take healthy, ideally dormant wood, and you can inoculate those with, you know, say oyster mushrooms, uh -huh. um, shiitakes, and also are very easy to grow. And they're perennial. So once you've established them and they're happy in a nice shady, moist spot in your landscape, they're going to then, come back year after year after year. Yes, yes. Beautiful. And, and so yeah, very little input for a yeah. lot of reward. 
Yeah, and they're delicious. They're yeah. so much better than what you can normally find in the store. It's, it's a whole different experience. Well, the, my favorite thing to grow is a fruit tree because you plant it once and you get food for decades. Hallelujah. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. So your favorite uncommonly good and easy to grow fruits? Oh, I have many, many. Right <laughs> now, right now, and we're here in uh, early June, our gumi bushes are just loaded with delicious, very medicinal fruit. So the gumi is a, is a big time favorite of mine. Uh-huh. It's a very tough, it fixes its own nitrogen and for nitrogen for plants around it. So mm-hmm. it's doing a stacked function there. Yeah. And it, it, it's it's a very medicinal berry. It has lycopene, which is, which is a very immune system supportive. Um, I want to say it's an amino acid. Uh-huh. I could, and anyway, it's copious, it's fast to produce. And it makes good wine, good meads. Uh, it's good to eat right out of hand. They, they kind of have a sweet, tart, sprite uh, oh, flavor to yeah. them, where you, you just can't you just can't walk away from the bush. You just uh-huh. until you get sugar belly, <laughs> you're just sitting there <laughs> eating them like crazy. Uh, chickens love them. Chickens will hang out under the bushes. Kids, um, it's a great pollinator. In the, in the early spring, it's one of the longest pollinators, along with its cousin, the autumn olive. Uh-huh. It is the biggest pollinator on the landscape in our area. I've been watching these uh, species. I've been watching this species. You know, certain people like to vilify it because it's opportunistic. Oh, right. Um, but I'm watching and seeing that it is providing a lot of services. It, it's yeah. wonderful habitat for birds, uh, pollinators, food for humans. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy if it's going to grow more around here. I'll no utilize kidding. it. No kidding. That is G O U M I. G O U M I. Uh, Lee Reich, uh, who's one of the gurus of uncommon fruits, uh-huh. one of my one of my heroes, um, spells it G U M I. Uh, I think it's you know coming from a Japanese word, right. um, but I think usually when you find it, it's G O U M I. Highly recommend it. it is, it's a fabulous, it's very very tough, very tough in all ways. And we have a lot of deer on our landscape, oh. and they do not eat it. Oh, interesting. Yes, so that's a big bonus that right there. Bonus. And it, I think it'll take salt spray. It'll take it'll take really terrible conditions uh-huh. and thrive. Wow. Oh, that's a favorite of mine. Well, I'm going to give that a shot here in Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure of uh, how warm it goes, uh, but it, I, it wouldn't surprise me if it went pretty far. Yeah. It's, pretty, it's pretty tough. A food forest, what is it? And ah. uh, do you need a lot of space? No, you do not need a lot of space. Uh, A food forest can be a patch. It can be eight foot by eight foot. Mm. It can be eight foot by three foot. Uh, It can it can be the border. It can be along a fence line. It's a very open concept. It is not something that has a strict definition. Mm -hmm. Uh, In our temperate climate, we're all all that all of us that are experimenting are sort of you know creating what it is. They're, they naturally occur in the tropics uh-huh. uh, where you have a high light intensity where you can stack overstory, midstory, understory, and still have you know fruits and nuts and very mm-hmm. productive systems in that stacked way. Uh, as you come more into the temperate zone, the light intensity you know it lessens, and you're going to want to take that concept of a of a stacked system mm-hmm. basically but you know the overarching idea of a food forest is 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 observing a healthy forest system, seeing how all of those multiple layers are thriving and working together, uh, and then taking that pattern and saying, okay, well, how am I going to do this on my landscape to grow the things that are important to me? You know, my fruits, my nuts, my medicines, maybe my building materials. So how do I take that and adapt it? And that's kind of where we're where we're at with the food forest. So mm-hmm. we're not growing food in the forest; we're growing food like the forest. Oh, interesting distinction. Yeah, and yeah, and, 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 yeah, and, and it can get overwhelming to learn about, uh, but it doesn't need to be. It can be quite simply: okay, I want to grow a fruit tree, uh-huh. but instead of going out in my lawn digging a hole and sticking it in there, and maybe if it's lucky, give it a little two-foot mulch ring, mm-hmm. uh, we're going to create sort of a patch, an area around it that we can plant beneficials, a little ecosystem to support that fruit tree. So we're going to want to plant things that are going to draw in extra pollinators, you know, things like echinacea, uh, coreopsis. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we're also going to want to plant things that are going to be mulch for the long term, things oh. like comfrey, horseradish, mm-hmm. things that we can sort of chop and drop and feed the soil. 
Uh, we're going to want to bring in beneficial insects. So we're going to want to plant things that give that good habitat, like yarrow, which has a really cool architecture to it for beneficial spiders and other All critters right. mm -hmm. to balance the insect ecology for your tree. And then we're going to bring in fertility. We're going to bring in some nitrogen, so a nitrogen fixer. You know, maybe we'll stick a gumi bush in there. Maybe we'll stick a, a lead plant or a, a lupin, something in the family that's going to fix nitrogen. So that and we can also be a mulch, so we can also chop and drop that nitrogen fixer to build soil as well as fertilize at the same time. So so really it's just kind of almost companion planting, mm -hmm. uh, usually perennials with your main producer um, so that it, it balances more for itself and doesn't rely on right. your input constantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of a nutshell. Becomes self-running. Mm -hmm. Love that. So let's talk about your book. Edible Landscaping with a Permaculture Twist. Tell me, tell me about the book. How did you get inspired to write it? What's in it? I've, 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 I've moved back from living in Latin America, uh -huh. um, Nicaragua, for the last, you know, the last decade or more. And to sort of reroute myself back here in uh, Appalachia and, and really in a very busy area uh, of the Mid-Atlantic you know, D.C., Baltimore, this whole corridor here. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the landscapes around me. I'm looking at the challenges. I'm looking at the suburban sprawl. I'm looking at all the runoff, the water issues, the, our Chesapeake Bay. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, I, you know, what can I do here? As well as also create an income and a life for myself. So I started Ecologia. And one of the things I did right off the bat was started doing hands-on workshops. I'm a very hands-on uh, teacher. So... I started doing workshops of, you know, digging swales, growing uh -huh. mushrooms. And after these workshops, people were like, well, you know, do you, do you, where can I find more information about this? <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, you know, there's, there's information on these things out there, but you really kind of got to surf through a lot of material, a yeah. lot of thick books. And, and I'm, you know, when I pick up a book, I, I, I'm looking for nitty gritty right away. Mm -hmm. um, that's just my style. So I'm thinking, all right, well, I guess I guess I should, you know, do some follow up notes for these workshops, and and, and very naively uh, began the process that way. <laughs> and when I got into it, it just kept developing, and I mm -hmm. just kept adding more material, and I had wonderful pictures, and and it turned into it turned into a, a very beautiful book without without necessarily that intention. But I and I self published. And and even before, you know, after I'd finished the book, Chelsea Green uh, had called up and said, yeah. you know, we're interested in, in, in uh -huh. distributing this book. So it's it's out uh, distributed through Chelsea Green. Perfect. And uh, it's very colorful, a lot of pictures, and, mm -hmm. and straight straight to how to. Basically, it's about eight chapters. Each chapter is, you know, how to how to create a food forest. You know, how do you how do you build swales? How do you build an herb spiral? Mm -hmm. How do you grow mushrooms? Um, how do you build an earthen oven? and a chapter on uncommon fruits. Uh, so it's, it's very how-to, very practical, right to it, uh, you know, kind of short on the philosophy. And I, I'm, I'm looking at it on your uh, website, ecologiadesign.com. Yes. And yes. Um, is this special here? It says, for a limited time, buy three copies and receive one free. Yeah, they make good gifts. Yeah, perfect. So, yeah, that'll be in the show notes page of the... Uh, podcast so uh, go check that out for sure yeah and our website has a lot of material it's in the book as well mm -hmm. uh, if you go through the many tabs I have there you'll 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 get a gleam you'll, you'll get a gleaming of um of what's in the book mm -hmm. oh here's uh I'm on your uh, meet the designer page and it looks like you got a couple of little ones that are holding up uh, squashes or something Yes, yes. I it, I had a lot of fun with the book, and that's kind of the one of the the beauties of of self publishing is, mm -hmm. is you know you, no one's saying hey I don't know about that or this. So I I had fun. I kept all my humor in it. I mm -hmm. put in recipes. I put in alcohol like cocktail recipes in mm -hmm. every chapter. <laughs> uh, nice. You know, with the yeah, with the idea that you know when it's summertime and everything's harvesting. It's it's hard to kind of get out there in the heat, and I'm like, well, what gets you out there is you yeah. know making a cocktail. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> it, it was it was with good intention. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So, can you talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it? Yeah, well, gosh, <laughs> it seems almost every day. Yeah. Not necessarily failure, but but learning. I guess on a larger picture, uh, a large lesson I learned uh, by starting a, a nonprofit, uh, a large project with a lot of vision to it, mm -hmm. a lot of my life, a lot of my heart, blood, and energy 
um, after I started that project in Nicaragua, after a couple of years, it was growing as I wanted it to, and but I kept holding on to it. I kept thinking, uh, okay, yeah. I really want to make sure this is going where I envisioned. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd spent too much time, and part of that was, you know, with with nonprofits, oftentimes you have to really sell the idea to your to people who might support you. Right. And if you're not careful, oh. you really kind of get stuck in that. Mm-hmm. Um, so so anyway, even though I was grassroots and I was just raising money from you know family and friends, right. I was like, okay, well this is what it's going to be. It needs to be this. And after a couple of years, it was growing and it was doing great, but it was kind of tearing me up because I was holding on to it. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. and, and a mentor um, and a teacher of mine, Doug Bullock, uh, one of the best permaculture teachers out there, uh, was a friend and helping me a lot at that time. He said, look, you got to you got to let go. You know, you got to guide it. You know, you have to let it go and in, in, in trusting hands, uh, but you got to let it go. And so that that was a huge lesson that I keep repeating in life, even with, you know, my growing system, my food forests, um, the projects I take on and get excited about. Uh-huh. I really have, you know, I've learned, OK, at a certain point, if it's starting to tear you up, if it's stressing you out too much. Let it go. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So what do you consider your biggest success? My biggest success, I, realizing that I'm, I'm living my dream, that I'm in it, uh-huh. you know, instead of thinking, oh, you know, I, if I keep doing this or if I do that, I'm going to be at this, I'm going to arrive at this, this, this sort of nice space or uh-huh. place in my life. Right. And, and my biggest success now is realizing that, wow, I've got it. I've got it <laughs> made. You know, I mean, I've got a lot of challenges. Yep. I've got, you know, a lot of things I'm juggling. But that, I think that's going to be consistent. And I just, my success right now is just realizing, wow, I've, I'm living my dream. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. It's happening. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. What, what drives you? What drives me? It, it, it shifts and changes. Mm-hmm. A lot that has driven me to start a project in Nicaragua and uh, a lot of things I'm focusing on here is, is being upset at, at the conditions uh, that I see mm-hmm. um, people living in conditions uh, of the environment. So that's that's part of what drives me. Uh, really wanting to try and buffer that. Yeah. Uh, try and try and try and offer resources for others who who want to sort of step away from a lot of the damage. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a big part of what drives me. And then I'm just excited. I get excited about the projects. I get excited about the plants I'm working with. I get excited about the projects. Mm. Like I'm building a circular straw bale home. I, I just oh, get wow. excited. I, I, yeah. yeah I, it, it, so it's a mix. It's putting those together, really. You know, seeing what I'm upset about and then using my passions to sort of, you know, create uh, alternatives. Yeah. So I'm all about education. I have to know, is there one book that has been really inspirational for you in this process? Well, many books. I, if I was to kind of focus it more on growing um, mm-hmm. and, and systems, uh, I mentioned Lee Reich earlier. Mm-hmm. He has one of my favorite books called Uncommon Fruits oh, yeah. for oh. Every Garden. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he really brings to life these these favorite fruits. Uh, in a way that's not overwhelming and actually makes you feel like you begin to know what they're like and right. you can work with them. Gummies, pawpaws. Um, he's he's got a wonderful collection. I support everything he everything he talks about in there. So he, that's a favorite book of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as does you know sort of landscape design and systems is I think someone from right there in your neck of the woods, uh, Brad Lancaster. Oh yeah. Uh, his his books on water harvesting. Yep. I believe it's water harvesting for dry, dry lands, lands and beyond. Yep. yep. He's got volume one and volume two mm-hmm. out. Volume two is real <laughs> straight to it. My yeah. kind of book where it's like how to. Right. And he you know he goes through a lot of scenarios about you know swales, berms, basins, water gardens, and oh man, it's a wonderful resource. I highly recommend it mm-hmm. um, for beginners, experienced. It, you know, it, I keep coming back to it. And, and being reminded of great design ideas. Beautiful. Yeah. So what one final piece of advice you have for our listeners? Oh, I would say start with things that are more likely to give you success. Uh, something like a gumi rather than, you know, in our area, trying to grow peaches. 
um, mm-hmm. nectarines, even cherries is very challenging because of all the humidity and disease. You know, start with something that's going to be, even if it's not your first choice, maybe it's not your favorite fruit, uh, you know, something that's going to grow easy, like a jujube. Oh, yeah. Jujube trees grow really easily. Mm-hmm. Persimmons grow really easily. Gumis grow really easily. In our area, pawpaws grow really easily. So it's like, okay, you know, let's let's start with what's going to give us success yeah. uh, and then build off of that. Mm-hmm. I think if you start with something maybe a little more exotic or challenging, uh, you may not get far and you may, you may yeah. throw the towel in too early. And so those specific uh, varieties that you mentioned, those are probably great for your area. What, for, what do people do if they're not in your area? Well, I guess I guess that depends where they are. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have the extremes, don't you, in the, yeah. in the very north of the country and the very south. Uh, you know, Lee Reich's species and, mm-hmm. and a lot of the, the ones in my book are are pretty pretty, pretty big range. You know, uh-huh. probably starting in you know colder zone four, going into zone you know eight or nine. You know, I, I you know you're going to get subtropics. It's going to change a little bit. There may be certain subspecies or particular varieties of some of these fruits that that you would have to be careful about selecting. Like uh-huh. for pawpaws, if you're going to go up north, there, you know, there's only there's a few varieties you're going to want to choose that are going to do well with a shorter season. So, you know, you're going to have to, you know, do a little research and look into right. that. Lee Reich, you know, really helps point out in his book and in the chapters mm-hmm varieties that might be better suited, you know, like mulberries. I mean, I would love to grow uh-huh. the black mulberries. Yep. Um, I think you guys can grow them well down there in the like south. Like a weed. Yeah, like a weed. Oh, you're so lucky. Yeah. Oh, I, I, they are gorgeous. Um, and figs. You guys can rock figs oh, down yeah, there. Oh, yeah, we I mean, can. Yep. Oh, yeah, so we, we, we cannot necessarily. So so really, I mean, it's, it, but those are easy ones, mm-hmm. you know. So, you know, start with what's easy and, and, and look for good varieties. So like, you talk about mulberries, most people are like, oh, I don't know, because they probably only had bird-seeded ones, yep, wild exactly. ones, which can be just very sweet and insipid. But a good grafted variety is going to have all kinds of complexities to it and one of the best berries I've ever had. Oh, yeah. So, we have a um, we have a Pakistani yeah. mulberry in the backyard here uh, in the oh. chicken coop area, and they're like three and a half inches long, and they stay on the tree for about a month. So we oh. get a fruit off of the tree for, you know, basically all of April, and it's just it's amazing. <sighs> yeah. So early too. Yes, yeah. I, I'm envious. That's a that's a nice yeah. treat. So, yeah, I, you know, do a little research. I've got some favorite nurseries. Uh, you know, as you as you purchase every year, you begin to learn who to buy mm-hmm. what from. And unfortunately, a lot of nurseries have grown in the last few many years, and, and the quality is, has gone down yeah. dramatically across the board. So you've got to be a little more diligent in, in, in um, finding stock, ideally that the nursery grows themselves mm-hmm. instead of passing things on through that they don't really have any knowledge of. Um, so there's a lot of good small nurseries out there. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today, Michael. It's been a treat chatting with you. Yes, thanks. Thanks for having me. So a couple of questions. How can our listeners get a hold of you? Website's pretty informative. It's uh, ecologiadesign.com. Facebook page is under the title of the book, Edible Landscaping uh, with a Permaculture Twist. twist. I just liked it while we were on the show. So Great. And uh, my... Instagram, I have a lot of fun with Instagram. Uh-huh. Uh, I probably put, post things there because it's so easy and, and snapping shots of what we're doing more currently. Uh, I'm at Permaculture Ninja. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. So check that out. Join up. You'll see a lot of the things we're doing now uh, with our with our straw bale house um, and, and oh, Hugo yeah. culture beds and, mm-hmm. you know, the things we get up to um, yeah. daily here. Yeah, exactly. All right. You mentioned it. I'm going to call you out on it. Hugo culture. Give us a two minute definition of what that is, because that is a cool concept. Yes, Hugo culture is basically wood covered with soil. Uh-huh. It's again based on a natural observation in a forest. Uh-huh. Where if you look at an old forest, it's lumpy, and uh-huh. pretty much that's trees that have fallen, leaf litter that's covered that. And if after many years you go and you kick that apart, and it is just this gorgeous black yeah. organic material mm-hmm. filled with life. So. In our part, our neck of the woods, we have a lot of um, deciduous trees. We have a lot of trees. So uh, what we'll do is when we're cutting branches or trees have fallen is we will 
put them into a bed, mm-hmm. and that can really be any size. It can be a foot tall, it can be six foot tall, mm-hmm. and generously cover that with soil. Maybe go ahead and you know go ahead and cover crop that, or cover that with um, straw, organic matter, uh-huh. and give that time. Um, it really takes about three years to hit stride, mm-hmm. but basically it's composting inside. Fungi are moving in breaking down that wood, creating available nutrients, and it's holding moisture. So then when you come along and you stick your berry plants in it or your your just your garden, your fruit trees, right. they have everything they need. They yep. have the moisture they need. They have the nutrients they need. And it's kind of ready, set, go. Mm-hmm. Um, and things really explode out of it. So and a lot of times people will take you know, if wood's coming down, they'll, they'll try and get it off their land. They'll, you know, they'll burn it. Or they're, oh, they're, yeah. they're, the resource that can be captured and put into soil building yeah. just takes a little patience. Yeah. Beautiful. And where do people get your book at? We have it on our website and okay. um, the ever-present Amazon. But through our website, it, you know, it comes more directly to supporting us. Mm-hmm. Um, so check that out. Um, Big fan yeah. of doing that. Yes. Yeah. Good. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Great. Thanks. Did you know that according to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, two-thirds of all our fruits and veggies eaten in the United States come from outside the country? And there are all kinds of problems with that. For one, an apple that had to travel hundreds or even thousands of miles to get to your plate can't be all that fresh or nutritious. And I say that's just crazy especially when we can grow so many different varieties in our own front and backyards. Jumping into growing your own food is actually quite simple. You just need to know the rules. My free webinar, Introduction to Urban Farming, begins to frame out your pathway to growing your own healthy food. In this free webinar, you'll learn the three simple steps to becoming an urban farmer, the five components of healthy soil, and how to think regeneratively which is, by the way, one of the most important concepts we need to be exploring right now. Will you join me in this webinar and help co-create the food revolution? Just text GARDEN to 44222 or go to urbanfarmu.org to sign up for your free webinar. That's GARDEN to 44222 or urbanfarmu.org. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.